Good morning. Right. It's almost lunchtime, so you're a little excited, right? Ready to get your eat on and hear about some troublesome women. <laughs> uh, speaking of troublesome women, before we get started, I'd like to introduce um, the president of our college. He's here today in the front row. Uh, <laughs> this is Rosa, <laughs> Dr. Rosa Carlson, and I'd like to welcome her also. Um, I'm very excited to be here today, and particularly for this session. Um, I have a mother who I consider to be the world's biggest troublesome maker, troublemaker. And if it was not for her and for the women in my life around me, I guarantee I would not be here today. Um, and in fact, I, if I had enough time, I'd tell you the story of my grandmother, who worked in the fields in Delano and was also a part of the um, one of the uh, picking that went on in Delano and the grapes in the 1960s. And, then, and even in the early 70s, I remember her coming home every day um, to us and talking about the struggle and the reason why she was out keeping membership in the fields and why it was important to, uh, to look out for one another and all the stuff that she taught us. And I look, into, I look to her as still being one of my greatest inspirations. Uh, with that said, one of our newest inspirations on our campus, um, I'm proud to introduce today to you uh, Ms. Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Baird. Um, she's a new hi history professor here at Porterville College. She received her bachelor's degree um, from UCLA uh, and the University of Connecticut, finishing her PhD soon, she says, at ASU, Arizona State University, all in history. Um, so if you have any history or questions or whatnot, Ms. Baird would be happy to introduce them to you or talk to you about them. One significant factor is that for all of you who are TV watchers, I know you watch TV every night when you go home. Um, she's going to be on Jeopardy on April 11th. Woo! Woo! Woo and she's agreed to donate all of her winnings and prizes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Without further ado, I'm very proud to introduce Ms. Barry. studying there. Newspaper ads would separate jobs based by sex. 
um, employers paid women less than men for the exact same work. And in the 1960s, we're talking about 58 cents for every dollar that men earned, right? so a little bit more than half. Bars could refuse to serve women just based on their sex. Right? So you can imagine you know, getting off of a hard day's work and you want to go have a drink, and you can't. They could legally refuse to serve you, you know, a margarita. Banks routinely denied women credit. You could go to a bank and look for a loan to buy a house or a car, and a bank could say, no, All right? And the sole reason is because you are female. Some states even excluded women from jury duty. Radio producers considered women's voices too abrasive to be on air. And television executives believed that women didn't have enough credibility to anchor the news. Right? If you guys have seen Anchorman, there's some truth in that movie, right? Um, women could not work as uh, firefighters. No women ran big corporations. No women ran a university or a college. Um, women did not work as uh, police officers. There were no women on the Supreme Court. Um, no women installing electric equipment, climbing telephone poles, owning construction companies. All hurricanes that hit our country, <laughs> named after women, are based on a belief that women bring chaos and destruction in their wake. And as late as the 1970s, a well-known physician, a doctor, proclaimed on national television that women were too tortured by hormonal disturbances to ever be president of this country. Every woman was addressed either as Miss or Mrs., depending on her marital status. And if a woman wanted an abortion, legal nowhere in America, she risked her life searching among quacks in back alleys for competent and compassionate doctors. The public felt that most rape victims had quote unquote asked for it, and most women felt too ashamed to even report um, rape as a crime. There wasn't even language that existed to make sense of things like marital rape, date rape, domestic violence, or sexual harassment. And really just two words summed up the hidden injuries that women suffered in silence. That's life. And so Rosen gives us a really vivid picture of the recent past. And keep in mind, this is a past that is less than 50 years ago. And the changes came about bit by bit, wrought by troublesome women, activist women, many seen as troublemakers, women who could not leave well enough alone, women who were outspoken, and who would not be silenced no matter the consequences. Um, these troublesome women have brought deep and transformative change to our country, and it's to them that we owe a great deal of gratitude, right? And change coming in such a transformative way that I think in a lot of ways it's even hard to uh, think about what it existed, uh, what existed in this country before the 1960s and second wave feminism. Right? So my talk today is going to kind of look at some examples of these troublesome women. But I wanted to start with a little background on why we're actually here today. Right, we're here today to kick off Women's History Month. Women's History Month actually started back in um, okay. the early 1900s. I've got this great quote from Susan B. Anthony here. A troublesome woman herself. Right? It was we the people, not we the white male citizens, nor yet we the male citizens, but we the whole people who formed the nation. Right. Women were here as well, and we were active in the formation of this country. Women's History Month actually started with International Women's Day early in the 20th century, right, a day to celebrate the actions of women and their roles in life. Originally, it was a socialist holiday, and it became a day for women to protest, to go on strike, to petition for the right to vote, to lead parades, just kind of an activist holiday. Today, it is a holiday in some nations, but not here in the U.S. It is recognized by the United Nations, and they create a theme for women's, uh, International Women's Day every year. 2014's theme is Equality for Women is Progress for All. And so March 8th became um, International Women's Day, originally celebrated in 1914. And the Women's History Month well, that has its roots in the social movements of the 1960s. So things like the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, um, identity studies, right? All these good things that are coming about in the 1960s. Women's History Month is one of the 
directly out of that. 1978, the school district in Sonoma, California, uh, voted to make a National Women's History Week, devoting a whole week to women's history. And two years later, President Carter made it a National Week, so National Women's History Week. By 1986, that was expanded into Women's History Month. Um, who knows if you'll have a Women's History Year Sunday? Right. This is also coming right off of uh, things like Black History Month as well, um, which was started a decade earlier in 1976 and recognized as a National Heritage Month. Uh, students today might think that it's pretty obvious that women should be included in any study of the past, but this was not always the case. Can you guys hear me okay? Just right, If we were to take ourselves, right, our whole auditorium here, and transport ourselves back into a history classroom in, say, 1950, we would have a much different experience than we would have today. Uh, we would learn primarily about the political history of our country and mainly about the important roles that white men played. Uh, we would learn about George Washington, okay. Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Edison, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, we might learn a sentence or two about Abigail Adams and maybe Betsy Ross. Um, and often the women that we would encounter in 1950s style history were seen as disruptive and outsiders. So think of people like the Salem witches, right? Disruptive, um, outcasts. Um, people like communist sympathizer Ethel Rosenberg, right? Dangerous women. Right? So our knowledge and understanding of women's contributions to history would be really limited and very sparse. And this was true of other groups as well, African Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, all of this history was just kind of pushed aside in favor of a dominant narrative. And this does give us a very, very limited understanding of our past. If we ignore the majority of the population and their life experiences, uh, we ignore their contributions to national history. Right? It not only creates a whitewashed version of American history, but an inaccurate version of history as well. And so Women's History Month then was created to kind of undo some of this and to bring women back to the forefront, at least for one month a year. There is a lot of controversy over Women's History Month, particularly in more recent years. Some say that heritage months like this are necessary, of course, that they create a strong focus on an oppressed group, and that it's a way to make up for decades, even centuries, of continued repression. Some feel that by having these events and even courses dedicated to um, specific identities, it does overemphasize the roles that oppressed groups play, but that this overemphasis is necessary until full equality can be achieved. And then there are others who feel that such things are outdated and that a more inclusive history that equally incorporates diverse groups is what we should aim for. So rather than having a Women's History Month, just have inclusive history. Right? It remains a really complex issue, um, and if you pay attention, look in the news, you will find articles, of course, about this from multiple sides of the issue. Right, the study of women's history then dates back to the progressive era, right around the turn of the century, when a small group of college-educated female historians focused their work on the lives of women. They looked at women in the American Revolution, um, and also at women's just average, everyday lived experiences. In the 1920s, these studies kind of decreased in number right around the time that women got the right to vote. And it was revived again during the civil rights struggles of the 1960s. In 1960, there were no courses on women's history in the United States. And there were very few female professors. But with second wave feminism or the women's liberation movement, the field of women's history was reborn into the field that we would recognize it as today. Right, this rebirth of women's studies then is extremely important in terms of political agitation and organizing. As Roxanne Dunbar said, quote, it is not enough that we take collective action. We must know where we come from, historically and personally, and how we can most effectively break the bonds. Understanding women's activities in the past then can be an inspiration for current and future action, for the continued push for equal rights for all. And women certainly have had a vibrant and active past. Um, in 1969, towards the um, later years of that feminist movement, there were only 17 courses on women's history in college uh, campuses throughout the country. 17 nationwide. By 1970, one year later, there were over 100. It gives you an idea of how quick this movement is growing. 
1973, there were over 200 uh, courses on women's history. And our first um, actual program on women's studies opened at San Diego State College in 1970. So California leading the way in a lot of this. And what this does is help to open the door for equality. It validates women's experiences and it makes their roles as full citizens of this country. It helps to open up a discussion on equal rights. It makes women's historical actions um, visible and it gives others hope, um, inspiration, and pride in what has occurred. It helps to show women that we do, in fact, have a national past, a national identity, that we are part of this country, and that we have been present and active players throughout that long history. Now, to give an idea of where things used to stand, in colonial America, women maintained the same legal status as their British sisters. Married women would merge their legal identity with that of their husband. We've got a nice colonial marriage going on here by creating what are known as coverture laws. A married woman became a femme covert, or a woman covered by her husband's protection. She surrendered all of her property to him at the time of marriage. And this could mean everything from her land, to her furniture, her clothing, her jewelry, and even her children, um, depending on interpretation of the law. Married women could not sign contracts, they could not testify in court, and they could not make any form of legal transaction. If your husband died, you would get one third of his property, even if you brought more into the marriage, right? You only get one third. And if Anne Faber has no legal rights or individual rights, she was viewed quite simply as the property of her husband. She could never be a full citizen since her allegiance was first and foremost to her husband, not to the state. To be a full citizen, one had to be independent. One had to be able to act on his own reasoning, and women were simply not allowed to. And in 19, uh, 1848, New York State passed a bill that allowed married women to retain some of their property, thanks in part to Polish immigrant Ernestine Rose and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, this process of legal change continued throughout the 19th century. And as one historian had no, has noted, his effort to protect women's property was in part an effort to prevent women from being property themselves. Um, a working wife was not even allowed to keep her own wages. You had a job, you had to surrender your paycheck to your husband. That was his also. Your labor was your husband's. In the case of divorce or separation, your children went to the husband's as they were also considered his property. And we can get a good idea of what these coverture laws are like if we look at cases of seduction or rape. These cases would have to be brought up in court by a husband or a father, because it was considered a crime against the man, not the woman in question. Um, as his daughter or wife's virtue had been stolen, rape or seduction was actually considered a crime of theft. And legislation reduced women to their value as sexual objects and prevented women from even defending themselves or bringing a case up in court. And of course, marital rape, while it did exist, was not considered a crime at all. And much of this changes during the mid-1800s with the Enlightenment ideas, with the spread of feminist thought, and some aspects of this femme covert status is going to remain here in America until the 1960s, and in some cases, until the 1980s, right, if we're talking about marital rape. Um, so with few legal rights, you know, what could women do? Right? How did women become active? How did women make themselves heard? Well, they became involved in social reform movements. They worked on petition drives, gaining signatures for legislation. They lobbied Congress. They met with political leaders, including the president. They published letters in newspapers. Um, they wrote pamphlets, sometimes under pseudonyms. They held Fourth of July parades, right, indicating their own patriotism and that they were, in fact, part of this country. And they made sure that their voices were heard. Women took action in whatever form they could. And we do see a long history of social activism in this country. Women like Abigail Adams, wife of Second President John Adams, who worked to petition for women's rights in the new government. Women like Sarah and Angelina Grimke, who were sisters from South Carolina, they became Quakers and um, extreme advocates for the abolition of slavery. They're also some of the first women in this country to 
to give public political speeches for which they were highly criticized. And we see women who led the first wave feminist movement as well, fighting for women's right to vote. Right? Women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Stanton was married to prominent abolitionist Henry Stanton. Together they had seven children. The last one, a surprise baby, was born when she was 44 years old. Um, Henry Stanton did not introduce Elizabeth to ideas of social reform. She kind of um, uh, met, they met on the Reform Network together. Um, she was already active. Her cousin was an abolitionist and ran a stop on the Underground Railroad, and it was through him that she met Henry Stanton. During their wedding ceremony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton refused to, quote, honor and obey her <laughs> husband, choosing instead to omit that phrase from her vows. And part of their honeymoon was spent in London attending the World Anti-Slavery Convention. How romantic is that? And it was there that she met and befriended Quaker Lucretia Mott, a woman active in abolition, moral reform, and temperance movement as well. And this is Elizabeth Cady Stanton with some of her children. In 1848, Stanton and Mott called a meeting at a local church in Seneca Falls, New York, to discuss this issue of women's rights. About 300 people attended, including former slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass, and about 100 people endorsed Stanton's Declaration of Sentiments, which you see here, um, outlining the needs for equal rights for women <coughs> in this country. And so the Seneca Falls Convention really marks the beginning of the movement um, for women's rights, including the right to vote. Many people, including her own husband, Henry Stanton, did not see the need to give women the right to vote. It was felt that women were represented politically through their husbands, and that entrance into politics would just be a corrupting force for women, and would detract them from their already busy lives of cooking and cleaning and raising children. At Seneca Falls, suffrage was the only resolution that did not pass uh, unanimously, showing that even those who were aligned with the cause of women's rights did not all agree on the idea of voting rights. <coughs> um, in 1851, Stanton met Susan B. Anthony, you can see here, who lived in nearby Rochester, New York, and they formed a collaborative friendship that would last until Stanton's death of heart failure in 1902. Anthony was a Quaker, right? she believed in equal rights for pretty much everybody. She never married, she never had children, and instead she devoted her life and her time to the cause of women's rights, causes of social reform and social justice, including abolition of slavery, temperance, and women's rights. Together, these two ladies will work during the Civil War to create a petition that will lead to the 13th Amendment, ending slavery in America, so active in equal rights for a lot of different people. This is them in their later years. So a long friendship, a lifetime of friendship between the two. In 1872, we have a presidential election, and Susan B. Anthony caused a lot of trouble by casting a vote in that presidential election. She literally went into a polling place, cast her ballot into the ballot box. This was illegal. She knew it was illegal, and she was arrested on the spot for doing so. A tremendous. Um, troublemaker right there. And she knew that this would happen. In fact, she counted on being arrested. She wanted to make sure that she was gaining a lot of publicity for the fact that she could not vote, and really what the consequences were for her casting one simple vote. Right, she went to trial, and in the end, the judge fined her $100. He did not sentence her to time in jail. Um, I think he was afraid that she would be a bit of a martyr to the cause. Um, so $100, which she stoutly refused to pay. One account from the trial quotes Miss Anthony. She says, quote, May it please your honor, I shall never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty. All the stock and trade I possess is a $10,000 debt incurred by publishing my paper, the sole object of which was to educate all women to do precisely as I have done rebel against your man-made, unjust, unconstitutional forms of law that tax, fine, imprison, and hang women while they deny them the right of representation in the government. And I shall work with might and main to pay every dollar of that honest debt, but not a penny shall go to this unjust claim. 
and I shall earnestly and persistently continue to urge all women to the practical recognition of the old revolutionary maxim that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Pretty radical stuff. She never paid that $100 fine, ever. Not a penny of it. And the government never collected on it either, because I think they were afraid of her. <laughs> By 1978, or sorry, 1878, we see the passage, uh, the proposed passage of the Susan B. Anthony Amendment in Congress. It was an amendment that would give women the right to vote, and it was swiftly voted down, which I think gives you an idea of how Congress viewed measures like this at the time. Only six senators voted for it. Um, I believe 36 senators refused to even vote, right? saying this isn't even worth casting a no vote on. Right? Neither Stanton nor Anthony would live to see women obtain the right to vote. But both of them knew that it was close. Right? These are women who dedicate their lives to equal rights, knowing that they will never see um, the benefits of their labor. The tireless effort of women like Stanton and Anthony helped achieve the suffrage for women in America. They laid the foundation for later women like Alice Paul to build on. They kept suffrage in the public eye right, and devote just tremendous amounts of energy to this cause. Um, not just the suffrage, but marriage and divorce reform, education reform for women, right, radicals, agitators, troublemaking women. Stanton and Anthony are representative of the many troublesome women who fought for equality during the 19th century. Um, but equality for women, um, this is just Stanton's gravestone. This is in New York. And if you notice on here, um, her husband, Henry Brewster Stanton, at the top here, it does outline all of his accomplishments in life. He was a noted philanthropist, a journalist, a lawyer, and also a senator. And then there's just you know, Susan B. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who apparently did nothing, right? And so even in death, right, she doesn't really gain that recognition, right? But this fight for equality was not just a white woman's issue, right? Ida B. Wells was born in Mississippi to former slaves. She went to university, but when her parents died in a yellow fever epidemic, she had to find a job. She found a job as a school teacher. And so she taught in Memphis, Tennessee, while continuing to gain an education at Fisk University in Nashville. In Memphis, in 1884, Wells was asked by the conductor of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company to give up her seat on a train to a white woman. They ordered her to move into the Jim Crow car, which allowed smoking and men, which meant there was you know, cursing and drinking, and it was already full besides that. Wells refused. She said she was a lady and that she was staying in the lady's car. According to Wells, quote, the conductor tried to drag me out of my seat, but the moment he caught hold of my arm, I fastened my teeth in the back of his hand. She bit him. I had braced my feet against the seat in front, which now she's got like her feet up, um, and she's holding on to the back of that seat. As he had already been badly bitten, he did try it again by himself. He went forward and got the baggage man and another man to help him. And of course, the three of them succeeded in dragging me out. It takes three men to drag her out. So a precursor to Rosa Parks here. As Wells was removed, all of the white passengers on board broke into applause. Wells returned to Memphis and immediately hired an attorney to sue the railroad. She won her case in the local courts, but the railroad appealed to the Supreme Court of Tennessee and it reversed, uh, reversed the lower court's ruling. Right, but troublemaking women right here. Wells became a journalist after this, and she gained a reputation as a progressive era reformer. She lost her teaching job in the process after criticizing the school system for not treating black children very well and for not having enough provisions for them. So she was getting a little too uppity for them, and they did fire her from her job. In 1891, Wells was subject to an attack by a black minister in Vicksburg, Mississippi. He made a claim publicly that all Southern black women were liars and prostitutes, just based on their race, and that white women were more virtuous and thus more desirable as wives. Some of Wells' friends were present at this, they heard him, and they held her up as the image of virtuous Southern black womanhood. 
He countered that since she had been fired from her job, this was proof that she was promiscuous, not a virtuous woman. Ida was livid. She was already back in Tennessee. She got onto a train and went back to Vicksburg. She met with the minister personally in a room full of male witnesses, confronted him, challenged him to repeat his comments to her face. He apologized, and she gave him a stern lecture on the virtues of Southern black women. Then she made him sign a statement that he agreed to read to his congregation, saying that his remarks about her were incorrect and that he was recanting them. Oh, In 1892, three of uh, Wells's friends were lynched. They owned a small grocery store that had taken some customers away from competing white businesses. And a group of angry whites attacked the grocery one night. But the owners fought back, shooting one of the attackers. The black owners were arrested, but a lynch mob broke out. Um, they broke into the jail, dragged the three men from their cells, and brutally murdered all three in the streets of town. Wells organized a boycott of the white-owned business, and she published about the attack. As a result, her newspaper office was destroyed. In fear for her life, she moved to Chicago, where she continued writing and helping to develop numerous reform organizations, all aimed at black women. She also became an activist for women's right uh, to vote, becoming friends with Susan B. Anthony. She traveled to Europe quite extensively, publishing and giving speaking um, engagements, all talking about the crime of lynching in America. She would even bring photographs with her, photographs depicting black men hanging from trees in the American South, sometimes with white children standing underneath them, smiling and laughing. 1895, she married Ferdinand Barnett and was one of the first women in America to keep both of her last names, becoming known as Ida Wells Barnett. In 1909, <coughs> she was one of two women to sign the document calling to form the NAACP. And even in 1930, she was still active, running for office in Illinois State Legislature. <coughs> she lost, and she died the following year at the age of 68. But she was an integral part of the campaign to end lynching in America and to make lynching a federal crime. Her journalistic efforts brought national and international <coughs> attention to a silent issue that had plagued American race relations. She fought tirelessly for equal rights for black women and white women um, and for people as a whole. And her outspoken and pretty feisty nature ensured that people would not forget nor they, uh, could they ignore a lot of the social problems in America. Right? So speaking out, and this is one of the books that she most famously wrote, Southern Horrors, or Lynch Law in All Its Phases, right? and asking people to just bring these um, crimes to life. Right? Lynching was something that people in America really did not talk about. It was an American shame. Uh, we tried to keep it hidden, and you have someone like Ida B. Wells going out, and not just um, nationally, but internationally, giving talks about this issue. Right, at four foot, 10 inches tall, Luisa Moreno did not look like a troublemaker, but she was. Relatively unknown today, Moreno stands out as one of the major heroines of the labor movement in America. She grew up in a wealthy family in Guatemala. Her father owned a coffee plantation, and her mother was a wealthy socialite. She grew up in a large home filled with uh, servants, tutors, and she didn't really laugh for anything. <coughs> At the age of eight, she contracted um, a fever that nearly killed her, and her father prayed and said that he would consecrate her life to God if she recovered. She did, and in 1916, Louisa was shipped off to a convent in Oakland, California to prepare for a life of religious devotion. And she hated it, hated it passionately. She hated the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church that she saw when uh, she was there, especially <laughs> the time of Lent, when um, people in her position would be eating bread and water and fasting, and she would see a lot of the older nuns sneaking large amounts of food on the side. Um, that upset her. She hated the discrimination that she faced there as well. When one of her classmates called her a Spanish pig, she punched her. <laughs> At the age of 15, she begged her parents to let her come home, um, and she was intent on gaining a university education. When she arrived back in Guatemala, however, she discovered that this was not allowed for women. 
So instead, she organized a group of friends to petition and lobby the government, and they won the right to attend college in 1920, the same year that American feminists were gaining the right to vote. And still, she felt trapped by her upbringing. She didn't want to end up being a socialite. She wanted to have fun and to live and to make a difference. After her sister got married, she watched her father empty all the fountains of their house and fill it up with expensive champagne, and she decided that this was not the life she wanted. She fled north into Mexico. In Mexico, she became a flapper, she joined the bohemian scene, hung out with people like Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, wrote poetry, uh, became a journalist, and then just barely 20 years old, she married a man who was 16 years older, it was an unhappy marriage. Um, he saw other women on his side, but she stayed with him, at least for the time being. 1928, pregnant with their first child, the couple moved to Spanish Harlem in New York City. It was here that Luisa would be called in her life's work in the labor movement. She found work in a sweatshop, laboring over a sewing machine day in and day out. And so here you have a woman who gives up a life of privilege to go work in a sweatshop, right, working 10, 12 hour shifts. And one of the things that is happening at this time in America too, women who are working in sweatshops like this, if you have children, you tend to leave your children at home, unattended. Um, some women would um, give their children opium, make their babies sleep during the day while they were at work, right? not a good thing to do. Some women would just leave their children unattended and hope for the best. Some women would actually tie a small rope you know, to a child's leg and to the leg of a kitchen table so that they couldn't wander off. But you do see a lot of tragedies occurring because of this, right? Women simply didn't have other options. You can either take your child to work with you, which was typically unsafe, or you leave them at home, right? You can't afford daycare, and they're certainly not gaining an education. She befriended one of the co-workers at her sweatshop, one of these co-workers who left her child at home unattended. And after a shift one day, she asked Louisa to come over and meet her baby, only to discover with horror that during the day while the child was left unattended, rats had eaten off part of that child's face. The child died days later. Louisa was horrified by what she had seen, and she didn't know what to do, but she knew that she had to do something. 1930, she joined the Communist Party, which was fairly active in Spanish Harlem, and she began to mobilize her own co-workers to create a small union. She did this on her own. She had no training, no support, uh, no financial support, and really no guidance, but it just kind of seemed to come naturally to her. Her small union grew and grew, and eventually she became a tireless organizer for workers' rights. By 1935, Louisa was offered a job in Florida with the American Federation of Labor. She officially left the Communist Party and moved to Tampa. And this was a dangerous job. The KKK was pretty active in the South at this time. But organizers hoped that someone like Louisa, who was light-skinned, who was pretty petite, and a woman, would not be a target. Here she focused on ideas of community and teamwork, telling workers, quote, one person can't do anything. It's only with others that things are accomplished. She organized a new labor contract that covered 13,000 cigar workers in Florida, right, so improving conditions for them. And then she worked on mobilizing cigar rollers in four different states before joining with a new union, the United Cannery Agricultural Packing and Allied Workers of America, better known as Yuka, uh, Yuka Pawa. By 1941, she became the first Latina to become vice president of a major labor union. Under Moreno, Yucapawa became a functioning union, able to negotiate for contracts, achieve workplace safety, um, gain better working conditions. She led workers to strike, resulting in a successful wage increase. 1939, Louisa moved to Los Angeles, where she helped create the first National Civil Rights Assembly for Latinos in the US. This assembly helped to ensure immigrant rights, rights to employment, housing, education, and she also helped to extend the reach of Yucapawa to multiple states, making it a vital force in the labor movement. Uh, by 1945, Yucapawa had become the seventh largest CIO affiliate in America. By 1947, Moreno retired, and she settled in San Diego with her new and nicer husband. 
And by 1948, under Cold War policy um, and fears of communism, Morena became um, questioned by her um, relation to the Communist Party over a decade earlier. She faced deportation for her affiliation with the party. Um, she was offered full US citizenship if she would give up other people. She refused. In 1950, she left the U.S. willingly, still under those fears of deportation, and she died in Guatemala in 1992. Luisa Moreno then lived a vibrant life and affected change wherever she went. Outspoken, hardworking, and an advocate for workers' rights, she represents a really rich history of labor activism among Latinos and Latinas. Moreno said, quote, they can talk about deporting me, but they can never deport the people that I've worked with and with whom things were accomplished for the benefit of hundreds of thousands of workers. Things that can never be destroyed. If we look into the 1950s, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. 1955, at the All Women Smith College, back east, Adlai Stevenson told the class of graduating women, the humbler will look housewife is what most of you are going to be, whether you like the idea or not. An article in Life Magazine in 1956 noted that women have minds that should use them, so long as their primary interest is in the home. In Milwaukee, women were prohibited from sitting at a restaurant lunch counter because, quote, men need faster service than women because they have important business to do. And in many organizations, women were expected to literally keep the headquarters clean and to cater to the male leadership. Even if we look at the African American civil rights movement, we have people like Stokely Carmichael and his oft-quoted uh, phrase, the only position for women in SNCC is prone on their backs, underscores the ongoing sexism that women faced even within the civil rights movement. And so in 1963, Betty Friedan wrote the feminist mystique about the life of suburban housewives in America. She wrote, the problem lay um, buried, unspoken, for many years in the minds of American women. It was a strange stirring, a sense of dissatisfaction, a yearning that women suffered in the middle of the 20th century. Each suburban wife struggled with it alone. She made the beds, shopped for groceries, matched slip cover material, ate peanut butter sandwiches with her children, chauffeured Cub Scouts and brownies, lay beside her husband at night. She was afraid to ask even of herself the silent question, is this it? The problem was less with being a housewife, but rather with the fact that women had limited options. They were expected to get married and have families and stay at home. Even college educated women were supposed to follow these social guidelines and eventually become housewives. Now, while many women found this fulfilling, they did desire something more from life. Suburbia was, for some women, a place of despair and boredom with very few options for expression or release, um, a sense of bitterness and disappointment. Right? Women had no outlets for self-expression, for enjoyment, for self-realization, and many women nurtured dreams that were unfulfilled but not unforgotten. The publication of the feminist mystique made Betty Friedan a household name. She challenged women to live an examined and purposeful life, and she made certain that each despairing housewife um, knew that she was at least not alone in her struggles. Um, Friedan wrote that, we can no longer ignore that voice within women that says, I want something more than my husband and my children and my home. And as one Wyoming woman wrote to Friedan, she said, my secret screamed as I stir the oatmeal, iron the blue jeans, and sell pop at the Little League baseball games, is stop the world. I want to get on before it's too late. I love my family dearly and wouldn't trade them or my life with them for anything. But as they go out each day to meet and get involved in this great, big, wonderful world, I yearn to tag along. In 1966, Friedan became a founder and first president of the National Organization of Women, or NOW, and now advocated a variety of women's causes, including abortion, birth control, equal pay, the passage of an equal rights amendment, maternity leave rights, welfare, daycare centers, just to name a few. Organizations like NOW were part of a second wave of feminism that broke open in the 1960s. 
a direct reaction to the repression of the 1950s. Second wave feminism focused on a wide range of issues, but lobbying groups like um, now were able to uh, force the federal government to concede some changes. And in the 1970s, things did begin to change. The feminist movement really heats up. The female employees of Ladies Home Journal staged a sit-in at work. And they got the demands of a free daycare center and an end to sexist advertisements in the magazine. The employees of Time and Newsweek then rose up and filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And in Boston, women reacted against a radio station whose job announcement simply read, if you're a chick, we need typists. And the movement continued to gain momentum. In August, for the 50th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, now urged a nationwide strike for equal pay, and thousands of women participated. And there were other signs of change, too. The first battered women's shelters were developed in America's large cities, finally recognizing this form of violence against women. The prefix ms began to replace miss or missus, an acknowledgement that women are not tied or defined by their um, status as married or single. The development and legalization of birth control pills gave women control over their family size and timing. And the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973 legalized abortion, ending an era where thousands of women died each year from secret botched attempts. Women's place in higher education were changing. Right. In the 1960s, only 5% of graduates in law, medicine, and business were women. By 1980, that was up to 25%. And the women's movement for equality continues to this day. We can see it in the campaigns for wage equality and equal employment opportunities. The debates over contraception um, and abortion have not died down in the 40 years since Roe v. Wade was passed. Women continue to fight sexist language in the media and in the public sector. Rape and the rhetoric surrounding discussions of rape continue to be debated in Congress, and women fight being seen as objects in the pornography industry or in photoshopped magazine <coughs> covers, now continues to draw membership. A lot has changed since the 1950s, but as in other civil rights movements, a lot remains to be challenged and overcome as well. And today I want to leave you with the words of Gloria Steinem. Just last week she wrote an article for Ms. Magazine in honor of Women's History Month. And she asked, how do we move forward? It's not rocket science. We need to worry less about what is most important and more about doing whatever we can. And remember, the end doesn't justify the means. The means are the ends. At my age, in this still hierarchical time, people often ask if I'm passing on the torch. I explain that I'm keeping my torch, thank you very much, and I'm using it to light the torches of others. Because only if each of us has a torch will there be enough light.